Hello everyone and welcome to an introduction to Zoroastrianism. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to keep this lecture pretty brief as I really just want to focus on um, some important philosophical issues and some discrepancies uh, between different conceptions of Zoroastrianism to help with the quiz and to distinguish between uh, what's posted in this lecture and what is included in our class text. So to start off with our introduction, uh, Zoroastrianism is one of the oldest living religions. So this is categorizing it as separate from an indigenous religion um, and the oldest of the major world religions. And it's going to be especially interesting to note that it is, as Zoroastrianism is the forerunner for all of the Abrahamic religions, meaning that it's going to share a lot of um, similarities but also important differences with the Abrahamic traditions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So definitely be sure to note those as we continue on in the class. So as one of the oldest living religions, it is also one of the smallest religions, um, having less than uh, 200,000 practitioners. And due to um, the predominance of other Abrahamic religions, uh, this number is dwindling. So we don't see uh, it as much, we don't see growth in this tradition as much. The founder of the tradition is named Zarathustra Spitama. In Latin, you'll see his name listed as Zoroaster, but these are the same individuals. And a, this individual is seen as a prophet, right? So not a divine figure himself, but someone who is uh, endowed with important messaging and knowledge that they will provide to the followers. So the origins of the tradition um, are supposedly uh, before the founder, right, existed. So the idea is that this religion um, had some, some prevalence, some existence even before Zarathustra, but the origins are considered rather unknown. Um, we do know that its location was in um, what was Persia and now Iran, but uh, this, like what we'll see in Hinduism, uh, often happens with these older traditions in that we just don't have enough information about how they began. A follower of Zoroastrianism is called a Parsi. All right, so the holy texts um, in Zoroastrianism are the Visparad, or the honoring of the lords, the Yasts, the hymns of praise, the Vindavdat, the rituals against demons. But the most important of these texts is the Avesta, which is not just the Book of Law, but also the language, right? So providing the terminology that's gonna be most important for Zoroastrian doctrine and also the rules, uh, primarily the ethical norms by which Parsis or followers of Zoroastrianism are meant to live their lives. The Avesta is comprised of the Gathas, the hymns or literal words of the prophet, the Yasnas or other writings which followed, and what we get from the Avesta is a very, um, the most robust conception of the divine in Zoroastrianism which is interesting because it's going to uh, capture a sort of transversal of views. So the Avesta is going to capture the older conceptions of the divine in Zoroastrianism as well as what they have turned into. And this is something that we'll see in pretty much every major world religion, right? As time goes on, these thoughts evolve and tr change over time. And so what we see is a common trend from polytheism, right, the belief in many gods, if not more animistic or um, environmental worshiping of nature, towards a conception of monotheism. And scientists and other, um, you know, sociologists and anthropologists have speculated as to why this is, that we see a common trend from polytheism towards monotheism. And the basic idea is that earlier on in human history, we didn't have as unified a sense of what the world around us was like. Things, you know, we didn't have conceptions of laws of nature, right? So things seem to happen independently of one another. And so given that sort of chaotic understanding of the world, it seems reasonable that people would posit a number of different gods, each of which is responsible for different aspects of nature. 
But as our empirical and scientific knowledge evolved, the idea then was that we gathered or gained a more unified conception of reality, which then would, of course, align better with the idea that there was only one God. Right, so that's uh, one, one possible explanation as to why we see this overall trend. And so those elements of polytheism and Zoroastrianism are going to be really important as we understand how Zoroastrianism was a precursor primarily for Judaism and Christianity. And so um, this monotheistic sort of later conception of the divine in Zoroastrianism ends up being the worship of one god named Ahura Mazda. But we're going to understand how some of those polytheistic components, uh, right, the belief in many gods, still end up being maintained in more of a dualistic uh, sense in that the monotheistic Ahura Mazda is going to be attributed with two primarily um, opposing but codependent attributes. So a little bit about Zarathustra. Again, he was considered to be a prophet, so even though he is no, quote unquote the founder, right, he didn't start the religion. The religion supposedly existed well before him, but he was a saushant, which is the, um, the name for a prophet in uh, Zoroastrianism, and his main goal is to help those who are currently believing something other than the truth. Right, so at the beginning, this would have been those who believed in something other than the polytheistic gods at the time, and then later on, those who believed in something other than Ahura Mazda. And the idea there is that the prophet, or the saushiant, is supposed to benefit the community with their knowledge, right, help make things better. And also, in that sense, be a benefactor, right, someone who is giving back to the community. So in this sense, much like we see in the other Abrahamic religions to follow, Zoroaster, Zarathustra is not considered to be the only prophet, but the most important prophet in that they are supposedly ending um, a cycle of prophecies that have occurred before, but maybe which have been misinterpreted um, or challenged or have been um, contaminated in some way by other views. And as we'll see again in the other Abrahamic religions, the last prophet that is uh, held up within the tradition is often supposedly the greatest in that they are the ones who are giving us the final truth, the final say on the matter. So again, we'll see this not just in Zoroastrianism, but we'll see this in Judaism, we'll see this in Christianity, and we'll see it in Islam. All right, and so the idea here is that this, these prophets are chosen by God right, in life to provide this messaging. And the one of the important areas that I want to um, distinguish from our text is that according to most religious historians, you are actually permitted to convert to Zoroastrianism. Now that might not be um, a commonly held practice today, which is why we possibly see this religion um, in decline, but there are other reasons for that as well. So just note that historically, right, conversion has been permitted to Zoroastrianism. Other significant leaders within Zoroastrianism would not themselves be considered prophets, but priests, right, figures of authority, and here we have the term magi to describe them. And this is a term that has taken on other meanings um, in various uh, Persian languages, typically, again, indicating some level of uh, magic or spiritual power on their behalf. And the interesting aspect of, of this tradition, it's something I mentioned in, um, or kind of gave a hint to in one of our other lectures, is that these individuals, in order to attain a sort of ecstatic religious experience, might often utilize um, help from natural psychedelics, right, or drugs, to bring about that uh, that ecstatic state, that altered level of consciousness. And so this was something that was used um, a lot by Magi's and um, by other significant figures who wrote later Zoroastrian texts. And uh, I mentioned that one of the most interesting ones is the uh, consumption of this juice of the Halma plant in order to not just maintain an ecstatic state for transcendency, but actually descendancy into um, what their conception of hell is like, uh, which is 
again, very similar to maybe something like what we understand with Dante's Inferno, right? Various layers of hell. And so in the Zoroastrian conception of hell, the idea is that there are many different areas, each of which is designated for certain people based on the sins or misdeeds that they committed in life. And so they're given very specific, very graphically described uh, punishments, right, in order to meet those, those misdeeds. And so what's interesting to note about Zoroastrianism, one of the things that separates it from its later Abrahamic versions, is that Zoroastrianism is not waiting for a moment where someone is meant to return or save the human race, um, as we'll see is the case uh, primarily in Judaism and Christianity. So here, right, there is no savior, right? We have the information that, that we need to live a good life. And so you make your choices and based on those choices, given the knowledge that you have, you deserve whatever punishment or reward comes to you in the afterlife. So now to talk a little bit more about the divine concept, right, of Ahura Mazda. I mentioned again that this monotheistic view is a later evolution or version of an earlier polytheistic tradition. So in the early polytheistic tradition, the word for gods was devas, and this is an interesting word which is later going to be similar to devils, right, or demons. And so what we're noting again the continuation of the language, but the difference in meaning as it adapts to a different conception of the divine. So these devas were the many gods at the beginning of the tradition. Some of the most important of these gods were Mithra, the god of light, light often signifying knowledge, right, something that we are aspiring to. And this particular god, Mithra, is the one who later ended up becoming most similar to Ahura Mazda or the, the wise lord. Another term to describe Ahura Mazda is Mazda Yasna. So this is something we'll see in every major, uh, especially monotheistic religion. Even when you have one conception of God, there are going to be many different names that we could call that God by. And this has to do with the fact that this God is meant to be infinite, right? Comprising many different characteristics. And so different names are meant to highlight different characteristics at a particular moment. So Mazda Yasna highlights the greatness of Ahura Mazda, the wisdom of Ahura Mazda, and the fact that we are meant to praise, right? prayer, give prayer to and worship that god. And so yasna, again, coming perhaps from the earlier text, the yasnas, right, and those hymns of prayer and worship. So Mazda Yasna, or Ahura Mazda, is considered to be the creator of all things in, it, in existence. And this, at the time, was a revolutionary conception of monotheism. So even though we had elements of polytheism in early Zoroastrianism, polytheism was the norm in other indigenous religions at the time. And so when Zoroastrianism started to convert to monotheism, this was a brand new sort of idea. And so um, again, if we think that the Abrahamic traditions are the first monotheistic religions, that's just inaccurate, right? Zoroastrianism is going to be the first of the living monotheistic traditions, right? And so what happened then and this is the case with any monotheistic tradition when it comes into a region that has predominantly polytheistic views, is that it turns those other gods into false gods, right? There is a misconception there that they have this divine status, and so those other gods end up being um, sort of repurposed, repackaged into the new monotheistic tradition in a way that helps to support the notion that there is only one god. So as I mentioned, what happened to the other devas or the gods, they get turned into demons, right? Because it's not going to be something that is, can be all that positive because they would then threaten the existence of the one god. So they end up being placed in a more negative and contrary position. The other deities that um, are closely associated with Ahura Mazda or Mithra primarily end up being repackaged as angels or supporting deities um, or lesser known spiritual entities. Um, in this case, right, we can, they're understood to be holy immortals, the Amesha Spenta, there are many of them. Um, we can understand this in, uh, 
you know, Abrahamic terms as being something like archangels, right? So we have um, a, a polytheistic sort of pantheon of gods, which are now split into two categories. We have, you know, those devas, which have become demons. And then we have other positive entities, which are going to be supporters of, right, but below in the hierarchy, Ahura Mazda. And so I have a link here for a complete list, but one of the important things to highlight is that we see a variation of gender among these holy immortals, specifically three masculine conceptions and three feminine conceptions. And this is interesting, again, as I noted in the ind uh, lecture in indigenous traditions, which is that when we see a greater gender balance amongst divine entities, whether they be gods or angels, that allows typically for a greater notion of spiritual equality, if not social equality, in the cultures that practice that tradition. Um, so under the, so we have Ahura Mazda now as the monotheistic god, and we have any positive entities associated here underneath Ahura Mazda as the holy immortals. Then beneath that, we have the Yazada, or what are called the adorable ones. And these are the, what would be classified under the archangels, right? They surround the throne of God. Um, there are supposedly a limitless number of these adorable angels, if you will. <laughs> um, but in the text, only 40 are mentioned and three of them are highlighted most often. Those three are Shrausha, the guardian of humanity, Ashi Vanguhi, the sister of Shrausha, the rewarder of good deeds, and Mithra. Here again, we're seeing a repackaging of one of the devas from before, right? Mithra capturing what was previously a notion of wisdom, now being repackaged as a notion of strength and of soldiering. All right, so now uh, bringing us to our main philosophical issue that's gonna be of import with Zoroastrianism. This again is the oldest living monotheistic tradition and it is the precursor for all of the Abrahamic traditions that follow it. But there's gonna be an important difference between the Zoroastrian conception of God, of Ahura Mazda, and the Jewish, Christian, and Muslim conceptions of God which follow. And this has to do with the idea of whether or not that one God is all good, right? So I wanna give you an introduction to what the problem of evil is, and so we understand then how Zoroastrianism ends up being the only monotheistic religion which does not fall victim to this problem. So traditionally, when we consider a monotheistic tradition, God is described as having the following attributes. God is eternal, meaning that God has existed forever with no beginning and no end. God is immutable, meaning that God is unchanging. God is infinite, right, in terms of space and time, not subject to any limitation, even conceptually. Oops. God is omnipresent, being present everywhere at every time. God is omnipotent, all-powerful. God is omniscient, all-knowing. God is simple, not in a simplistic sort of understanding, but in the sense that this God is one unified being, again, to contrast it with the multiplicity that we find in polytheism. God is immaterial, not composed of any physical matter. And again, God is omnibenevolent, all good or morally perfect. Amongst other things, like God's existing necessarily, right, not being dependent on anything else for their existence, and thus God existing self-sufficiently, not needing anything to survive. So you've noticed I've highlighted three of these attributes because all three of these together are what create the problem of evil. Right? The idea here is that if God is all-powerful, then God could prevent evil when and where they wanted. If God is omniscient, God would know when and where evil would occur to stop it if they wanted. And if God is omnibenevolent, then God would want to prevent all evil when it occurred. And so this problem only exists when we attribute these three things to God. So just note that if we were to remove any one of these attributes, then the problem of evil goes away. 
right? So for example, let's say I were to remove omnipotence. I think, okay, God knows everything and God is all good, but God just isn't capable of stopping evil. Or omniscience, God could stop evil, God wants to stop evil, but is just not able to know when and where it's going to occur to do that stopping of evil. Or again, I could remove omnibenevolence. God could stop evil, God knows when evil is going to occur, but God just doesn't want to stop evil. So you can understand why this problem persists in the Abrahamic religions, in Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. Doctrine, they are not willing to, practitioners are not willing to give up any of these three attributes. And so the philosophical problem of evil still persists. And so what we're going to note is that in Zoroastrianism, one of these attributes is not attributed to Ahura Mazda, and that is the attribute of omnibenevolence. So in Zoroastrianism, the one monotheistic god is not considered to be all good. And so we're going to want to understand why that is and how that not only helps them out of this problem of evil, but helps them to explain some other elements of their metaphysics. So the problem of, again is that an all good, all powerful, all knowing God would not allow evil to occur. Evil does occur, right? In this sense, we can refer either to moral evil, right? These are the harms that humans inflict upon each other. And by evil here, we really just mean suffering, right? At its most basic level. So, you know, we don't have to conjure up this very uh, rich sort of metaphysical conception of evil. Just we acknowledge that evil occurs in the sense that humans cause other human beings suffering as well as natural types of evil, right? So this would be suffering that is caused not by human agency, but because of some natural disaster, something that occurs in the world, right? So all evil in the sense is just understood as suffering, which definitely does exist. So as a result of maintaining both of these ideas, that God has these three attributes and that evil does exist, we're presented with one of two philosophical problems. The first of which is the logical problem of evil. And this is the deductively valid version of this argument, which says basically that those two things cannot be true at the same time, right? There's some sort of inherent contradiction between maintaining a God's existence that has these attributes and the fact that evil occurs. And so the logical problem means that if both of these can't be true at the same time, we have to get rid of one of them. And the idea is that evil certainly does occur, right? We cannot deny suffering. And so the option that we would have to reject is the existence of that type of God, right? So this type of God does not exist according to the logical problem because it would create a contradiction. The other potential problem we have as a result of these two assertions is an inductive version of the problem. And so this is the idea that, well, perhaps we can give some sort of story as to why this type of God would allow evil to occur, right? So that leaves open the possibility that they're not inherently contradictory, but because evil occurs, not just as a matter of fact, but in such great quantities, we are presented with what is known as the evidential problem, which means that it's in fact very unlikely that this type of God exists, right? Or any type of God exists, right? If we're going to attribute those, those attributes to them. Okay, so two versions of the problem that emerge. If we maintain that God has these three attributes and that evil occurs, that either creates a logical contradiction, in which case we're, ha we're gonna have to get rid of the claim that this type of God exists, or it creates the inductive evidential problem, which is just to say that this existence of evil makes it very unlikely that this type of God exists. All right, so again, why is it that Zoroastrianism is not going to succumb to the problem of evil in the same way that the Abra other Abrahamic traditions will? Well, this has to do with notions of dualism, which are widely maintained within all of the major world religions, right? The idea that there are two opposite and op opposing forces contending for control, right? So this is most commonly understood in, uh, in the Christian tradition, right? As a battle between um, the divine being, God, and its antithesis, meaning the devil. But, right, one of the 
potential problems there is that, of course, God is not meant to have an equal, right? That the devil is just a fallen angel, and so there should be a disparity between powers in these two forces, right? But the general idea is that they are two opposing forces battling for control over humanity in the world. And so what we get as a manifestation of dualism in Zoroastrianism is that if God created everything, right, then God is responsible for everything. And they still maintain that evil exists in the world. So what that means is that we have to attribute two different types of being or moral character to God or Ahura Mazda. And so that manifests in the following two names being given to the different characteristics in this regard. So there's Spenta Mainu, or the beneficent part of Ahura Mazda, and then there's Angra Mainu, which is considered to be the evil part of Ahura Mazda, right? And so the idea is that, again, if God created everything that exists and evil exists, then God must have created evil. And so it would not be problematic then to attribute both good and evil to God, right? So the idea is that this is part of a monistic conception, a singular conception of God, right? In the sense that one God has both of these attributions at the same time. And we get a little bit of a connection here with some Eastern religious traditions, perhaps if you're familiar with notions of the yin yang, right? The idea that these two attributes can exist simultaneously and are so interconnected that they actually cannot exist without the other, right? You cannot have good without evil and vice versa, right? And as a result, they have both always been present just as God has always been present. So they coexist and are codependent in this way. So what we see then as Zoro and Zoroastrianism starts to um, sort of evolve into what will later become the, the Jewish tradition and then the Christian and Muslim traditions is that Ahura Mazda ends up being later on associated primarily with Spenta Mainu or the more beneficent spirits. And as a result, Spenta Mainu, I'm sorry, uh, Spenta Mainu, the, the beneficent spirit becomes something like Al Ahriman, where Angra Mainu later gets named Shaitan which later becomes the word for Satan. So this is really important. Our notions of Satan or the devil in Christianity can be traced back to this earlier conception of Zoroastrianism, where God had two opposing spirits within itself. Okay, and so some other aspects of Angra Mainu, right, are um, Eshma, the demon of wrath, disease, and death, which is considered the second in command. So again, just as we saw a hierarchy within the archangels, right, with the beneficent spirit, we similarly later on start to see a hierarchy amongst the evil spirits. And this again has to do with the idea that we attribute both aspects to God because we observe both aspects in the world and also in humanity. So this notion of duality is continuing in our conceptions of what a human being is, that there are two components of personal identity, in this case, a body and soul. And this is something that again will be shared with all of the Abrahamic religions that follow. And that originally human nature begins out as morally neutral. So this is um, more in line with the Jewish conception of human nature as opposed to uh, Christian conceptions of human nature, which actually start out more with a deficit, right, that one needs to overcome. So the idea in Zoroastrianism is that humans are born pure and without sin, right? So they are born sort of as this blank slate, and then based on their decisions, right, they will either become good or become evil, right? So you can choose to serve one or the other because you will find both choices available to you in the world. And this is consistent with the notion that humans have free will, right? So one of the other issues that emerges with the problem of evil, primarily in Christianity, is the idea that we are given free will, yet we are meant to choose um, only the good, right? But there might be uh, some sort of problem with maybe the origin stories of humanity, say in the Garden of Eden, where we were meant to choose good before we even had knowledge of what good and evil are, 
right? And so there's this conception of maybe some sort of entrapment there. But here the idea is that we're born mor morally neutral, right? Capable of making either decision. And what's interesting about this is that there's not going to be any sort of divine justice or repentance in the afterlife. So even though Zoroastrianism does have a conception of the afterlife, what decisions we make on earth will have consequences only on earth. There won't be some way for you to, uh, you know, we, we can't hope that evil people are going to get their punishment in the afterlife, right? The idea is that whatever justice occurs in the world will happen in this life. And this is because the idea is we are already endowed with the ability to reason about our decisions and we're already in charge of our own destiny. And so whatever happens to us in this life is thus deserved based on our actions, right? Because we're already responsible for our own choices and thus anything that happens to us again is simply just retribution for the actions that we have chosen. And so the goal then is to make good choices here and now, right? There's no sort of um, reliance upon the afterlife to make up for any injustices we faced in the world. And so we're meant to cultivate our virtue or our asha, right? And participate in this moral battle, hopefully using our free will to choose good in this life. And so on the right here, you can see um, a, a doctrine that is sort of, you know, embodying this idea that evil to evil, good to good. Meaning that if you commit evil acts, evil will be returned to you. If you commit good acts, good will be returned to you. So what are the ethics, the rules that we're meant to follow? Well, there is a very high standard of righteousness and virtue in Zoroastrianism. On the right here, you can see a full list of their moral virtues. I'm going to highlight some of the ones that are seen as most integral to the tradition. But these virtues primarily revolve around notions of education, right? Because if we have free will, we need to be educated to make the right decisions. We are aiming towards happiness, right? Good things happening to us in this life. Love with uh, others, maintaining those relationships, honesty, friendship, and prosperity. So what's important to note is that there is no advocation or promotion of violence in Zoroastrianism, as that itself would be a supposed sign of evil. There are also great concerns for cleanliness and the environment in Zoroastrianism. We see some of these other no uh, emphases on cleanliness in later Abrahamic traditions, but the concern for the environment is pretty unique in that it is widely accepted throughout Zoroastrianism and maybe so not so widely accepted in the other Abrahamic traditions because of the emphasis on justice and paradise in the afterlife. So if the concern in Zoroastrianism is on this life, then humans are seen as God's assistants, right? We are serving God by making this world a better place. And we do that through the triple principle, right? We engage in good thoughts, we engage in good words, and we engage in good deeds. And so in this respect, we're going to see an emphasis on uh, various virtues that correspond with that through the symbol on the right known as the far vihar. So uh, definitely take a look at that so you know what each part of the symbol represents. But the idea there is that we're aiming towards creating a perfection on earth. Even though there will always be good and evil, we should be striving towards more goodness than evil. So what sorts of worship do we see in Zoroastrianism? Right, because this is an older tradition, we're going to see a lot of emphasis on blood sacrifice, something that we saw in earlier Abrahamic traditions as well. Notion, uh, focuses on prayer, ritual rites of passage, sacred clothings, right? Uh, specifically a, a sacred shirt and a kushti, which is a belt with specifically 72 threads of string, and a number of holy days, which you can take a look at here. But the most important and unique element of Zoroastrian worship is the aspect of fire worship. And it's important to clarify what this is because when we look at aspects of religious worship, we might often confuse it with thinking that the thing that is being used in the ritual is itself considered sacred as opposed to whether or not it is symbolic of something sacred. And so fire is seen as having uh, contained very miraculous powers of protection, right? And so the idea is that it will help us do good deeds and have good thoughts. And so the flame itself is, again, 
symbolically sacred. So it's not that fire is a god or anything like this, right? But that the flame or the fire is a symbol of God's warmth, kindness, and mercy. So even though we might see fire as maybe a destructive force, right? We have to think back towards its purpose in human survival and evolution, right? Fire is something that has helped humans uh, succeed and survive over time. And so we can understand it as being associated with the more positive aspects of God or the world, right? So it's not considered sacred in and of itself. Another important uh, aspect of uh, Zoroastrian practice and in its connection to their respect for the environment is how they treat um, and ritualize components of death. So it's important to note that there is absolutely no burial permitted in Zoroastrian tradition, no wood burning cremation. You'll notice in the bottom right, there is a unique uh, contemporary version of cremation, which is done purely by electricity. And there's also no sea disposal. So the reason that these types of practices are permitted with dead bodies is that dead bodies have been, I think, aptly understood to be unhygienic or unclean. And so there is a concern about burying a dead body in the ground, right, the earth that is sacred, burning it in a fire, which is sacred, or disposing of it in the sea, which is sacred. So the idea is that Zoroastrians um, uh, praise and uh, protection of the environment limits what they can do and how they can dispose of dead bodies, right? Because otherwise the body would be seen as contaminating those sacred elements of the environment. And so, right, this comes from uh, laws that were in, in, introduced later on, not specifically those mentioned in the Gothas. But one of the most interesting uh, ways around these limitations on bottle disposal is through the Towers of Silence. So that's what those other three photos on the right are. You can see in the bottom left what the tower might have looked like from the outside. Um, there are very few of these towers left in existence because you basically, as you can see on the top left, would place the bodies in the top of the tower. Birds would come uh, to consume those bodies as they decompose, and then the bones would be washed down into the center of the pit. And you can think practically what sort of problems this would create, um, primarily in that these towers couldn't be located too close to a city because if you had a significant number of deaths at the same time, you would have the smell of that decomposition, um, you know, permeating the region. Also, um, one of the other issues has to do with the birds and whether or not they would come to consume the bodies, in which case that seemed to decrease over time. And so these became less and less practical um, in terms of their use, which is why you see the later instantiation of this electrical sort of cremation, which is really fascinating um, if you're interested in taking a look at it. But again, before the bodies are even put into the tower, right, there we see this um, very rich, ritual of uh, washing and cleansing the body, something that we'll see carried over in the Jewish tradition, right? There's a very long and extensive process of maintaining the cleanliness of the body as much as possible, right? But as I mentioned, they're then placed in these open compartments, devoured by birds. Historically, right, when these the prominence of these birds were at their peak, they could be devoured in um, as quickly as 30 minutes. And then again, the bones would be washed down the center well. So again, the problems with this is that the birds were either too few or the bodies were too many to be consumed in enough time as to uh, evade the smell of decomp decomposition. And the uh, lack of the use of towers of silence have made other methods uh, necessary to get around the previously mentioned limitations. So in addition to electric cremation, they have also started to utilize uh, burial in lead-lined caskets, right? Specifically lead-lined so that the decomposed body does not uh, seep into the surrounding ground. The last thing that I want to talk about is the Zoroastrian conception of eschatology or the afterlife, right? What happens at the end of our lives. And so this typically has to do with beliefs concerning the end of the world or the end of life when we use this term. And so at the end of life, right, we have the, the death, we talked about the burial rituals, but the 
idea or the belief in Zoroastrianism is that the soul remains with the body for three days after death, which is typically the time in which the body would be being cleaned, right? So you would not subject the body to uh, decomposition during this time. And the point there is that the soul remains to meditate on the deeds that they uh, committed within their life. They are then seen as going to what is called the Chinvat Bridge, which is considered the place of choosing. Now, this is uh, supposedly happens on the fourth day, and the soul is then journeying to this bridge or this place of judgment. But what's really interesting to note, I have a little footnote here, is that there are different stories or narratives about what exactly happens on this bridge. In some rare cases, there is a, a deity or a deva present on the bridge which would make a judgment on your behalf. But that's actually a very minor uh, and limited interpretation. The most prominent interpretations of what occurs on the Chinvat Bridge is that there is no one there present and that you simply have to cross the bridge on your own. And if you are able to cross the bridge, that would signify that you are confident in the fact that you lived your life committing good deeds, whereas if you were to not be able to fall off the bridge, as you can see in the depiction on the right, if you were to fall into the river, that would be an indication that your conscience knows, right, that you have committed evil deeds. Right, so if you are quote unquote judged evil, but really if you just know that you have done evil deeds, right, you would fall and go to hell, which is considered to be the worst place. And this again is um, described in great detail in the text by Arta Viroff, um, which is that individual who took a drug induced trip to the afterlife. Uh, hell is not described by Zoroaster as he did not take any um, trips into the afterlife and so did not have those experiences to relay to others. If you are judged good, right, you are then seen as going into paradise or the best place, which it is believed you will remain until the end of time. But what is interesting about the Zoroastrian conception of time is something that is carried further um, in Judaism, but also mostly in the Eastern religions, which is that time is not linear, but cyclical, meaning that at some point, everything that exists will be destroyed and the cycle of creation will begin all over again. And so even paradise is not permanent, right? You remain there until the cycle begins again, right? But either way, these are seen as states of mind more so than physical places, right? So it is sort of a conception of being in a mental state of affliction or pain, right? Or a spiritual state of pain, as opposed to a spiritual state of bliss. So again, the goal in the afterlife is to achieve happiness or the best experience, not to you know, receive some reward or anything like that, but simply to enjoy the fruits of your decision or to be burdened with the pain of the decisions that you had made. And so you can see here on the right, the idea here is that you only live once right in that cycle there is no reincarnation, right? So it's not like your soul would continue to exist once the process of creation begins all over again. And I'll end this by talking about the impact again of Zoroastrianism, right? So um, practitioners, Parsis were exiled from Iran in the 17th century due to um, wide impacts of religious persecution. And they then arrived in um, the uh, sort of central uh, west segment of India, and then compose less than 0.2%, uh, 0.02% of India's population, but have still made major contributions. So again, even the Zoroastrianism is the smallest of the living traditions, it having been the oldest, has widely impacted the other major world religions. It was involved in uh, the nationalist movement in India, as well as modern industry, financial housing available, availability, and other major institutions. In 2005, the Oxford, Oxford Dictionary of Philosophy identified Zarathustra as the second philosopher chronologically, right? So looking at historically the oldest philosophers, he is considered to be one of the oldest. 
And Mazda Yasna, right, is not just meant to capture this conception of God, but also a rational system of ethics. Right, some claim that Zoroastrians even helped to educate later Greek philosophers, right? So tying their impact not just to the uh, prevailing or uh, following religious traditions, but also to philosophy. And as such, they've had an extensive impact on not just um, Islamic philosophy, right, in the region, but also Iranian and Persian philosophy.